Lecture 26 of Numerical Methods is about a very heavy-duty subject. It's an introduction to the existence and uniqueness theory for ordinary differential equations. This is something that's very abstract and difficult. However, it's really important also for people who want to do numerical methods and also learn how to do numerical analysis. So it's definitely worth learning. In fact, I'd say it's one of the premier theoretical subjects that has a lot of practical implications in terms of implementation of numerical methods to know what can go right and what can go wrong. So you want to have a piece of paper handy, a pencil, uh, be able to pause the video every so often and check things, maybe have some coffee ready to get going and learn this challenging subject. It can make you famous, actually. Solving mathematical existence problems can still make you famous. It would, could make you famous 300 years ago, it can make you famous today. There's a very famous problem called the Navier-Stokes Millennium Prize problem that if you solve it, you'll be world famous and you'll even win a million dollars. Prove or give a counterexample, which is an example that shows something is false, of the following statement. In three spatial dimensions and in time, given an initial velocity field, for, for example, for a fluid flow, there exists a vector velocity and a scalar pressure field that could change over time and that illustrate how the flow of the fluid evolves over time, which are both smooth and globally defined. They exist and they satisfy certain properties. They solve the Navier-Stokes equations. So again, if you could solve this problem, you'll be world famous and even get a million dollars for that. That said, let's get into the basics of existence and uniqueness. First, the lecture plan for lecture 26. We'll start simple. We'll talk about existence and uniqueness for just pure antiderivative problems. Non-elementary antiderivatives make this question not clear at first, but we will get into how to make it more precise. How do you Prove existence, it's really the fundamental theorem of calculus, or what is often called the second fundamental theorem of calculus. That proves existence. Uniqueness follows from the mean value theorem for derivatives, it turns out. Then we'll talk about existence and uniqueness in more general kinds of problems, more general kinds of differential equations. We'll illustrate with an example that uniqueness actually can fail. You can come up with pretty simple examples where uniqueness fails. We want solutions to exist. We want to know we're studying something that actually exists, but we also want them to be unique. You know, we use solutions to make predictions. You don't want two different predictions, for example, for what's going to happen when you send that spaceship off to Mars. You want to know what's going to happen. You want unique solutions. But here, in simple examples, we'll see that uniqueness can fail. We'll see two existence and uniqueness theorems. You might say they are the two simplest theorems, though they are plenty difficult to understand. Um, though, ultimately, we'll see that they have somewhat limit, limited applicability. We can use them in some ways, but we need to be cautious and realize that we can't use them in every situation. There's a local version based on certain continuity conditions, and the second one is a more global version based on something called a Lipschitz condition. Then we'll talk more about what a Lipschitz condition is and an example of that. Then we'll look at consequences of uniqueness non-intersection of distinct solution curves, which is a practical implication. And then coming back to numerical methods at the very end, like I said at the beginning, we need to be aware of the things that can go wrong. Things can sometimes go very wrong, in fact. You can have vertical asymptotes for your solutions, for example, um, and that would mean your numerical method is probably going to be very wrong in its approximation. Secondly, sometimes wild behavior can occur when your differential equations uh, involve terms that can get very large, for example. All right, let's get into existence and uniqueness again in the simplest situation for antiderivative problems. To this point, in lectures 24 and 25, we have either implicitly assumed or explicitly verified that our differential equations have solutions. We talked about what is a differential equation, what does it mean for a function to be a solution, and we checked functions were solutions. We talked about how to solve differential equations in certain special cases called with a method called separation of variables. You should know that method doesn't always work. You need to be able to separate the variables to be able to use it. You also need to be able to do some integrals. And then we talked about approximating solutions with Euler's method in the last video and geometrically interpreting solutions in terms of something called the slope field. Solutions had better exist if our slope field graphs and our approximation schemes are going to have any validity. If they don't exist, then we are studying nothing in effect. Is this always true? 
Is this question even clear enough? What does it mean for a solution to exist? For example, does the following pure antiderivative IVP, which stands for initial value problem, that happens to be related for, to normal distributions from statistics have any solutions? y prime equals dy dt equals some function of t, that's what makes this a pure antiderivative problem, I'm looking for a function whose derivative is this given function, little f of t, which happens to be e to the negative t squared over 2, where y of 0 is some arbitrary initial value, y sub 0. Does this have any solutions? In a very limited sense, no it doesn't actually. It has been proved that this function has no elementary antiderivative. In fact, you can see lecture 23 about numer numerical integration where I talked about this more. However, in reality, it does have a unique solution. Are these statements contradictory? No. The first statement that it does not have a solution as an elementary function means you just can't find a simple formula for it. The second statement means it does have a solution that exists as a well-defined mathematical function, but its formula is not some kind of simple formula that we're used to. An antiderivative satisfying the, the initial condition, in fact, can be written down in a formula. Here it is, y equals capital F of t, I'm using a capital F here to emphasize it's an antiderivative of little f, equals phi sub y zero of t, I'm also using this notation as I've done in the past couple lectures to emphasize it's a solution of the differential equation satisfying this initial condition, equals the initial condition y sub zero plus the integral from zero to t of e to the negative u squared over two du. Now, first of all, is there anything special about this letter u? No, that's just a dummy variable. I could call it anything I want. I could call it v, I could call it w, it doesn't matter. The important thing is the variable for this function is this upper limit of the integral here. For any given value of t, we can plug that number into the upper limit of the integral, compute the integral, add y0, and we have an answer. But wait a minute, how can we possibly compute the integral if we don't know an antiderivative of this function? Hmm. And wait a minute, isn't this kind of cheating? I mean, we're writing down the answer as an integral. Well, duh, right? I mean, we're trying to find an antiderivative. Turns out that, no, we are not cheating. First of all, most fundamentally, for any fixed value of t, the continuity of the integrand function, the function we're integrating, implies that this definite integral here is well-defined. The definite integral from u0 to a fixed value of t of e to the negative u squared over 2 du makes sense. It's well defined. Again, u is a dummy variable. It doesn't matter what I call it. I could call it v. I could call it w. Think of t as fixed, however. You know, in other words, the area under the graph of this integrand function is also well defined. You look at this picture, the graph of this function, f of u, which is e to the negative u squared over 2, is nice and continuous. This area for any fixed value of t makes sense. I could change what t is. I could even make t negative and it would still make sense because I would need to interpret it in terms of switching the limits of integration if I want to interpret it as an area. Technically speaking, this means that the limiting values of the Riemann sums that define the integral exist and equal the same number no matter how the sample points in the Riemann sums are chosen, whether they are left end points, right end points, midpoints, or arbitrary points even, as long as the width of each of those approximating areas goes to zero, the limit is still the same. That's the technical definition of what it means for the integral to exist. Here's an animation showing the Riemann sums with left hand endpoints being used at the, the sample points, and you can see as n increases the area of all those rectangles added together is approaching the area under the graph. So when you have a continuous function, that area is well defined. So secondly, what's the other important thing about this? For any fixed value of t, we can also approximate the value of the integral with numerical methods like I talked about in lecture 23. I did a quick overview of numerical methods for integration. And actually, if we allow ourselves to use Taylor series, that are special kinds of power series, the solution actually does have a formula. It's just not in closed form. Not in closed form, which means a finite form, as an elementary function, which means a function you're used to, polynomials, rational functions, trig functions, inverse trig functions, logarithms, exponentials, etc., and any finite combination of those kinds of things. 
So let's see what the answer is in terms of a Taylor series. So here is the abstract formula for the solution in terms of an integral. What we can do is we can replace e to the negative u squared over 2 with its Taylor series, which is an infinite series, using the well-known Taylor series for e to the x, replace all the x's with negative u squared over 2. Try that. I encourage you to pause the video and try it and see that you'll get this series, and you see the first four non-zero terms there. Assuming we are allowed to integrate term by term, which we can do here, it turns out we will get this. So this would be a formula in terms of a Taylor series, a special kind of power series, for the original function uh, that will equal the original solution function, in fact, for all values of t, depending on what y0 happens to be. And in fact, we can approximate the solution with this. We can take higher and higher order Taylor polynomials where we truncate we make it a finite sum to approximate solutions. Here is an animation of that. We can see the actual solution there, phi sub 0 of t. I'm taking y0 to be 0. That's in blue. And you see tnt. That is not meant to be a pun, but it turned out that way. Those green graphs are approximating the true solution as the uh, number of terms that you're using gets higher and higher. Okay? In general, as far as existence goes, the fundamental theorem of calculus, or what some people call the second fundamental theorem of calculus, can be used to guarantee existence uh, when the right-hand side function, that little f of t, is continuous. Okay. So what does the second fundamental theorem of calculus say? I'm going to state it in a way that's useful for differential equations here. This is not the way it's usually stated. Suppose little f is continuous on a closed interval. That's the same. Define a function phi sub y0 of t, well, one difference is this is usually called capital F, that equals y sub 0 plus this integral. Another difference here is that I'm putting the y0 in there to make the initial condition happen at t equals a. This, the output of this function is going to be y sub 0. Then this function that I'm defining in this way with this variable in the upper limit of the integral is differentiable. It has a derivative over the entire interval and satisfies this initial value problem, dy dt equals f of t, y of a equals y sub 0 for all t in the interval. So this function does satisfy this differential equation as long as the right-hand side function, little f, is continuous. Okay. In other words, if you want to be even more specific, we can say phi sub y0 prime of t equals little f of t for all t in the interval. When we're at the endpoints, you'd be thinking about left and right-hand derivatives and it satisfies the initial condition. When you plug in a, you get y sub 0. The first equation from the previous line, this one right here, is sometimes written this way. d dt, the derivative with respect to t, of this function of t, this variable right there is the variable for this function, equals, well, first of all, 0 because the derivative of a constant is 0, plus the derivative of the integral, and that gives you the original integrand right there. So this is effectively saying that the derivative, the d dt, undoes the integral. They are inverse operations in some sense. Okay, So you've probably learned about this from calculus if you're watching this video in the first place. And um, it is essentially the existence theorem in this context. So a solution to each such initial value problem exists. That's what the second fundamental theorem of calculus guarantees. But is it unique? Is it the only possible answer? The answer is yes, but why? Well, it's based on the fact that any two antiderivatives of the same function over a given interval differ by a constant. That's why we add the plus c to doing indefinite integrals. And also the fact that the initial condition must be satisfied. Those two facts together guarantee uniqueness. We're going to go through the argument for uniqueness here based on this fact in a second here. But first, let me also remark that this fact, that any two antiderivatives of the same function over a given interval differ by a constant is something that follows from the mean value theorem for derivatives. I'm not going to go into details. If that's something that interests you, you can look into it for yourself. So here are the details for verifying the uniqueness. If we assume, well, call it psi of t, also satisfies the same initial value problem. dy dt equals the same function, little f of t, same initial condition, y of a equals y sub 0, over the same interval from a to b, then we can conclude, first of all, that the derivatives of these functions must be the same because they both equal little f of t. 
for all t in the interval. They both satisfy the differential equations. But that means there's a constant c, where psi of t can be written as phi sub y0 of t plus that constant c for all t. That's this fact up here that any two antiderivatives differ by a constant. If I subtracted phi from both sides, I get psi minus phi is a constant c. However, if we now plug in t equals a, first of all, into this expression, phi, of, phi sub y0 of a plus c, well, by that previous line, that equals psi of a, which equals y0, which we know also equals phi sub y0 of a, because these things satisfy the initial condition. In other words, c must be 0. That's the only way that this thing on the left can equal this thing on the right. And we can conclude, in fact, that these two functions are the same. The c must be 0. These are the same function for all t in the interval. In other words, the solution is unique over the entire interval. Okay? So that wraps up existence and uniqueness really pretty much completely for antiderivatives. What about um, more general kinds of problems? For example, what about existence and uniqueness for initial value problems that come from autonomous ordinary differential equations where the right-hand side function is a function of the dependent variable y? Now this is pretty strange. If you haven't watched lecture 24 and lecture uh, 25, you're not going to know what this is talking about here. We're not looking for a function of t whose derivative equals some function of y. We're looking for a function of t whose derivative, with respect to t, equals f of phi of t. When you plug in phi of t in place of y on the right-hand side, that's really important to understand. And what about initial value problems for mixed ordinary differential equations where the right-hand side depends on both t and y? And to be a solution, phi of t, you would have to say phi prime of t equals f of t comma phi of t for all t when you replace the y with phi of t. It's much harder to prove existence and uniqueness for these kinds of things. Solutions themselves, in fact, are typically impossible to find in closed form using elementary functions, just like our more complicated antiderivative problem. In fact, sometimes f itself can be relatively nice, like even continuous everywhere. Yet, for example, uniqueness can fail in such a situation. Existence won't when the function is continuous everywhere, but uniqueness can fail. Here's an example, in fact. It's a pretty simple example. d y dt equals f of y, this is autonomous, equals y to the two-thirds power, that's not a typo there, and y of 0 equals 0. So the fact that we've got a fractional power here does tip you off to the fact that maybe this is kind of a weird example. What happens if you try to solve this initial value problem, say, with separation of variables? Well, if we divide both sides by y to the two-thirds, we'll get a y to the negative two-thirds on the left, and we'll get a 1 on the right. Integrate both sides, do this integral, and this one. This one's easy to do, to get t plus some arbitrary constant, call it c1. This one's not too hard to do either, right? You would add one to the exponent, negative two-thirds plus one is positive one-third, and divide by that same number. Dividing by one-third is the same as multiplying by three, so you can write this. Our goal is to solve for y, so I then want to divide both sides by three and then raise both sides to the third power to get that one, get rid of the one-third power there. And you could write this where you know the c here is not the same as the c1 there. It really would be c1 divided by three. So this seems to be some sort of general solution of this differential equation. What about satisfying this initial condition? Plug in y equals 0 and t equals 0 to get 0 equals c cubed, and therefore c itself must in fact be 0. This is then giving us one solution of this initial value problem. It would be, would be t over 3 quantity cubed, which could be simplified to t cubed over 27. In fact, however, this initial value problem has two distinct solutions. Maybe you can even guess the other one? It's a really simple function, actually. It's a constant function. It's an equilibrium solution. There's this function that we just found, call it phi of t equals t cubed over 27, and another function, call it psi of t equals 0 for all values of t. And notice I'm using the three lines for my equal sign there. That's actually a pretty standard notation to use when we're saying this function is identically equal to zero, always equal to zero for all t. Its graph is a horizontal line at y equals zero for all t, identically zero. These are two distinct solutions 
of the same initial value problem. Now they do go through the same point, the origin, 0, 0, when t is 0, y is 0, but other values of t give you different outputs. So this is like saying if this were a model for a real life situation based on this initial condition, it's predicting two different things as time moves on. That doesn't sound like it's such a good thing. We, we would want uniqueness for prediction, prediction sake. What, why did this happen? We can try to interpret this geometrically, but I will warn you, it's not really a complete understanding that we're going to gain out of it, just sort of a basic intuitive understanding. Geometrically, both of these functions, phi of t and psi of t, do indeed follow the slope field, as we've talked about solutions having to follow the slope field, of the uh, defined by the right-hand side function f of y equals y to the two-thirds. So here is the slope field. I've made the uh, slope marks kind of thick here and the graphs themselves kind of thick to... I needed to make the graphs themselves extra thick, but I also wanted to make those slope marks thick to emphasize that along the t-axis here, when, when y is zero, all these slope marks have a slope of zero, which makes sense because zero to the two-thirds is zero. All these slope marks have constant slopes along horizontal lines because this is an autonomous equation. Along any given horizontal line, y is constant and you um, find the slopes of those slope marks by plugging into this function. So for example, when y is 1, 1 to the 2 thirds is 1. All these slope marks along the line where y is 1 have a slope of 1. And both of these solutions, the black one is psi of t, that's always 0, and the blue one is phi of t, that's t cubed over 27. They both indeed follow the slope field. So why did this happen? Why did we get, get two solutions? Intuitively, just at an intuitive level, this is no proof, the, while the right-hand side function is continuous everywhere, it fails to be differentiable at y equals 0. Maybe you've seen that from calculus. So while it is nice, it is not sufficiently nice. Here, in fact, is a graph of the right-hand side function as a function of y. It's got a cusp at y equals 0. This is not the graph of a solution that we're looking at here. This is a graph of the right-hand side as a function of y. Notice y is the horizontal axis here, whereas in the slope field, t is the horizontal axis, and in fact, y would be the vertical axis, though I didn't make it there. Okay? This graph over here is not a solution curve. It's not the slope field. It helps you understand the slope field and gives you, well, a sense that something weird is going on, at least, at y equals zero, though this doesn't give even complete intuition about why possibly you could have two solution curves satisfy that initial condition at the origin here. And why, if this function was differentiable, if it were smooth, why would that mean that these solutions could not cross? Why would uniqueness be satisfied in it? And it would be if the function was differentiable, in fact, with at least a continuous derivative. So it's not completely clear still. Let's move on. Let's talk about existence and uniqueness theorems next. Okay, so this is where it gets even extra hard because we're going to talk about the theorems themselves, but you do want to work at understanding these things if you're going to have a complete picture of what's going on. And even then, it's still not really complete, as we will see. And again, to help you ultimately, we will see in the very last slide, to realize that certain things can go wrong with numerical methods. Actually, we'll talk about things that go wrong before that point, but I'll re-emphasize that in the very last slide here. So on this slide right now, and on another slide to come in a couple slides from now, are two existence and uniqueness theorems. Theorems are mathematical statements of fact that can be that have been proved using rigorous deductive logic that apply to more general kinds of problems where the right-hand side is an f of y or maybe an f of t comma y, not just pure antiderivatives. Here's one called the local existence and uniqueness theorem. Okay, so you have hypotheses. We're making some assumptions. This is abstract. That's why it, what makes it difficult. Suppose you've got a function f of t comma y, a function of two variables. And when you, when you think about this function in and of itself, you're not necessarily thinking about differential equations. This is a multivariable calculus function, a real valued function of two variables, two independent variables, t and y. We could graph such a function. It would be a surface in three-dimensional space. We could make what's called a contour map of it, understand its behavior. 
Now you could imagine, for the sake of just making this concrete, that it's got some nice formula involving both t and y. Also assume that the partial derivative of this function with respect to y, what is the partial derivative? It just means you're treating, in this case, t as a constant and thinking of this as a function of y and differentiating with respect to it. Notice the partial derivative symbols, these curvy d's are not the ordinary d's. Is that some mystical difference there going on? No, it's just a different notation. Okay, we could use ordinary d's there. We could, in fact, some people still say df dy. The reason we use slightly different notation is just to alert us to the fact that, hey, we've got a function of more than one variable here. Suppose both of these functions are continuous over some open rectangle. So this is a rectangle in its interior that in fact does not include the boundary as far as the set goes. Call it R. It can be written as what's called a Cartesian product. A comma B is an interval, an open interval on say a horizontal T axis and C comma D is an open interval along a vertical Y axis. I'm going to show you a picture here in a minute. The set of all points T comma Y satisfying these strict inequality theory. That's called an open rectangle. Let T zero comma Y zero be a point inside this rectangle. And since it's an open rectangle, it doesn't include the boundary, doesn't include the rectangle itself as part of the set. This point cannot be on the boundary. It's a point in R. And consider this initial value problem. dy dt equals f of t comma y. y of t zero equals y zero. I could have used y of a, but I wanted to use the a as the left end point of this, the open interval on the t-axis. Then, here's the conclusion. There exists, this is an existence theorem at first, a possibly very small number epsilon greater than zero. Epsilon is a common Greek letter mathematicians like to use to denote a very, possibly very, very small number, arbitrarily small. You know, could be 10 to the negative 100 power or 10 to the negative a billion power or whatever such that two conditions hold. And this is a little complicated, pay attention. There exists a function phi of t. I could have called it phi sub y zero again. Again, that notation is just to emphasize that y zero is the initial value, but here I'm just not bothering with that. That satisfies the initial condition, phi of t zero equals y zero, and satisfies the initial the differential equation, meaning its derivative with respect to t equals, remember what I said a few minutes ago, f of t comma phi of t. I need to replace the y with phi of t. And this is true for all values of t over some possibly very small interval centered at t0, from t0 minus epsilon to t0 plus epsilon. In other words, we're saying a solution exists of this initial value problem. It satisfies the initial condition, satisfies the differential equation for all t in some possibly very small interval. And it's unique. If psi of t is some other solution of the initial value problem, satisfies the same two conditions here and here, just use a psi instead of a phi, then in fact psi of t and phi of t must be equal for all values of t satisfying the same condition. Now, technically speaking, if you were proving such a thing, the epsilon in, in each of these cases could be different, different small positive numbers, but then you could take the smaller of the two. Uh, as something that would work for both of these conditions. This is saying the solution is unique. Here's a picture showing a generic situation. We've got the open rectangle here in pink. The dashed line is the boundary of the rectangle. The fact that it's open means the boundary itself is not included as part of the set. T0 is in this open rectangle, so it's not along the boundary. Um, T0 comma Y0, this is your initial point. The initial value of t is t sub zero, the initial value of y is y sub zero. And here we have a blue curve that's supposed to be a solution of this differential equation. And in fact, it must be the unique solution. I made my interval from t zero to minus epsilon to t zero plus epsilon in this picture be somewhat large compared to the entire interval from a to b, but it could in theory be pretty small. What would make it small? Well, if your, your uh, slopes in the slope field give you big slopes like right away near this point, that would mean your solution curve could go outside of this box, this rectangle, pretty quickly. Notice at t0 minus epsilon and t0 plus epsilon, that's when the solution exits the box, so to speak, exits the rectangle, the open rectangle. 
Okay, so you know, in your mind, I didn't draw the slope field, but realize in this picture, you I could have drawn a slope field, and the solution would be would be following it. That's the picture you want to have in mind to help you understand this abstract theorem. But it is also important to consider examples as you think about abstract things. So let's think about a particular example. Let's go back to our autonomous example where the right-hand side function is y to the two-thirds. And just make some remarks. We can first remark that if r happens to be an open rectangle in the ty plane that is intersecting the horizontal t-axis where y is zero, then the local existence and uniqueness theorem of the previous page cannot be used. It does not apply in that situation for initial points on the t-axis. So the point is it does not contradict our example where we did not have a unique solution because that point is on the horizontal t-axis where y is zero and where this function has a derivative with respect to y. You can think of it as a partial derivative. You can think of it in this case as an ordinary derivative because you don't see a t on the right hand side. That function fails to be differentiable at y equals zero and so the derivative with respect to y of this function is not continuous on this rectangle. So you can't use it. So it doesn't contradict it. On the other hand, if your rectangle does not intersect the horizontal t-axis, so either c is positive or d is negative, if c is positive your rectangle would be above the horizontal axis, if d is negative your rectangle would be below the horizontal axis, not touching it at all, then you can apply, you can use the local existence and uniqueness theorem um, to say that this kind of problem, this kind of initial value problem where y0 is non-zero, so it's not on the t-axis, do exist and are unique, at least locally speaking for t sufficiently close to t0 and so you're not touching the t-axis with one of these solutions, okay? So you, you can apply it if the point is not on the t-axis because you know, if it's not on the t-axis, you can make a tiny little rectangle that also does not touch the t-axis and apply the theorem on that tiny little rectangle if necessary. Here's a side note. There is a weaker version of this theorem that guarantees solutions do exist when the right-hand side function in, in its general form f of ty is just continuous. However, if you only assume it's continuous, and do not assume the partial of f with respect to y is continuous as well, then you're not guaranteed uniqueness. And again, this example illustrates that there are examples where you do not have uniqueness. Here's another theorem. I'm calling this a global existence and uniqueness theorem. And for my students in numerical methods at Bethel, this is the main theorem in section 5.1 of our textbook. So now we're going to consider a different kind of set not a true rectangle, but a certain domain D that in fact is closed, it's going to contain its boundary. Its boundary is going to consist of two vertical lines. It's a closed infinite vertical strip. It goes up and down forever. So it's closed in the horizontal direction. T is between A and B inclusive. Notice the less than or equal to's here, not less than's. And, but y can be any number. y goes from minus infinity to infinity. So this is going to be an infinite vertical strip going up and down forever. And suppose little f of ty is continuous on d. If you also assume f satisfies something called the Lipschitz condition on d in the variable y, which I haven't said what that means yet, then the initial value problem, dy dt equals f of t comma y, y of a equals y0, so a is the left-hand endpoint of the interval, and y0 is arbitrary, has a unique solution, call it phi sub y0 of t, defined for all t in the interval from a to b, existing and unique for all t in the interval. So here's a generic picture. Your pink region here that you need to imagine goes up and down forever is this closed infinite vertical strip. It's closed because it contains the lines at t equals a and t equals b. I made those bold and not dashed as opposed to the rectangle where it was dashed. Here you see our initial point uh, y of a equals y zero. This graph exists and is a solution, a unique solution for all t in the interval. It does not have a vertical asymptote. It doesn't go off to infinity when you satisfy this extra Lipschitz condition. But what in the world is a Lipschitz condition on d in the variable y? We need to get into that a little bit right now. 
In fact, a lot. So, take a breath. A function little f of t comma y is said to satisfy a Lipschitz condition in the variable y on a subset d of the plane. This r2 here means two-dimensional space, the plane, the real number coordinates. If there exists a constant, call it l, that's positive, such that this inequality is true whenever the points that you plug into f, t comma y1 and t comma y2, are in the given domain. Okay. Now there's nothing about this set D being an infinite vertical strip here. It could be a rectangle, could be a, some sort of generic blob, could even be the whole plane for all you know. Nothing about that here. If this inequality is true, then you say it satisfies a Lipschitz condition with this constant. And in fact, the constant L is called the Lipschitz constant. What does this mean? Essentially, it means the distance between the outputs of the function along vertical lines, t is constant here, y1 and y2 could be different, can't get too big too fast, so to speak, as y1 and y2 move apart. It's bounded by some constant, which could be a big constant, l could be big, times something that represents the distance between y1 and y2 itself along a vertical line. So yeah, again, intuitively, effectively, these outputs, the distance between them can't get too big as y1 and y2 go apart. Do we have to check this condition if we want to use the theorem from that other slide, the, the global existence and uniqueness theorem? And by the way, I forgot to mention the reason it's called global instead of local is there's no epsilon anymore. It's true over the entire interval. That's why I'm calling it global instead of local. Not typically. We don't typically have to check the Lipschitz condition. Instead, there's another theorem that can be used that's a little easier to check, though you should realize this theorem, maybe you can't always use it. Depends on how difficult the problem is. So here's this theorem. Suppose little f of ty is defined. Now I am going back to an infinite strip. I, I probably should have added the word closed vertical infinite strip. To emphasize we are talking about that. I, that, that's what I meant to put in there. Before I put it in the uh, link in the description below, I think I'll add those words if I remember. Uh, this theorem can be generalized uh, to D being something called a convex domain, not necessarily a closed infinite vertical strip, but we, were, we are only going to talk about it in the context of a closed infinite vertical strip. If a constant L exists with the property that the partial derivative of F with respect to Y in absolute value is less than or equal to L for all t comma y in this domain that we are again thinking of as being a closed vertical infinite strip, but in general could be a convex domain, then f satisfies a Lipschitz condition on d in the variable y with Lipschitz constant L. Okay, I'll show you an example of this here in a, in a second here. Proving this theorem, it's actually not as hard as you might think looking at it. Um, it once again, as we saw with another fact, you know, 20 minutes ago or so, does require the mean value theorem for derivatives to prove it. It's, it's not too hard to prove. Unfortunately, in many situations, such as with the logistic model, which we've talked about in lectures 24 and 25, dy dt equals f of y equals ky times 1 minus y over l, where k is the continuous growth rate when the population is small and l is something called the carrying capacity. The right-hand side function here does not satisfy a Lipschitz condition over an entire closed infinite vertical strip. It might over some smaller domain, but not over some closed infinite vertical strip. And what often happens in such situations is that solutions to certain initial value problems, at least, can blow up in finite time. In other words, the graphs can have vertical asymptotes, which doesn't sound like such a good thing if you're going to use it for predicting things. And it also doesn't sound like such a good thing if we're going to try to approximate solutions with numerical methods, because how is a numerical method going to blow up? Well, I suppose it could, but you might think intuitively it doesn't typically. And in fact, in many situations, including in this situation, it would not blow up. But the solutions themselves do blow up. They have vertical asymptotes. In fact, this happens with the logistic model. If we take k to be 0 0.04 and l to be 1, as we did in lecture 24, and we get the solution. Uh, notice it depends on the initial condition y0. This is a unique solution of an, the IDP 
with y of 0 equals y sub 0 for this differential equation when k is 0 0.04 and l is 1. If you didn't watch that lecture, you can, or you can just take the time to check this. If y0 is bigger than 1 or y0 is less than 0, this function actually does have a vertical asymptote. It does blow up in finite time. For example, if y0 is negative 1, now this is a little fishy here. I mean, populations can't be negative. Um, hang with me here. Then if you replace y0 with negative 1, what's going to happen? You'll get a negative 1 up here. You'll get a negative 1 down there. 1 minus negative 1 is 2. You're going to get this function. It's going to simplify. Phi sub negative 1 of t simplifies to this expression here. And that, as you might expect by looking at it, does have a vertical asymptote. So at the bottom can be 0, and you get a vertical asymptote. And if you solve for t, it turns out to have a vertical asymptote at about 17.33, 25 natural log of 2. Of course, yeah, it's not really a big deal for this particular model because populations can't be negative. Um, however, it could occur in more realistic situations for other models. I will encourage you to check that in the case where y0 is bigger than 1, which could occur for this model, there is still a vertical asymptote, though it's in backwards time. It's where t is negative, so that's maybe not such a big deal either. But again, there could be other realistic models for realistic situations where you could have vertical asymptotes for your solutions. And yeah, that, that's a bad thing, perhaps. All right, one important kind of example where a Lipschitz condition in the variable y does hold over a closed infinite vertical strip is when the right-hand side function is linear in y, while possibly nonlinear in t. Okay. For example, consider this initial value problem. dy dt equals f of ty equals this expression involving both t and y. It's nonlinear in t. You see a t to the fourth and a t to the fifth. If you treat t as constant, it's linear in y. You see only y to the first power. And suppose we let y of 0 equal 3. And we're considering the following vertical strip, infinite vertical strip. t goes between 0 and 2, including the endpoints. So we've got um, bold lines along our vertical strip. y is arbitrary. It is an infinite vertical strip. For this function, you can check that the derivative with respect to y is bounded above over this infinite vertical strip. Here's the computation. The partial derivative with respect to y is what? Well, you need to treat the t as a constant. Just pretend the t is a 2 or something. So 5 times 2 to the 4th would be 5 times 16 is 80, and 1 plus 2 to the 5th would be 33. As a function of y, it's linear. Treating the t as a constant, when you take its partial derivative with respect to y, you just get the expression in t. You get this right here. Don't see any y's anymore in that. It's not a function of y anymore, or you might say it's a constant function of y. I'm going to still use that notation there anyway. And for any given point in the closed infinite vertical strip D, we can say that this thing is bounded above an absolute value. For example, for one thing, when uh, t is greater than or equal to 0 here in the strip, I can get rid of the absolute value signs. And I can say this fact is true. Why? Well, this expression certainly is less than or equal to any expression that I get by replacing the t in the numerator with the biggest possible value of t in this domain. And also, if I make the t in the denominator as small as possible for this domain, which is 0, think about that. That's going to make this fraction as big as possible over this domain. Making the numerator as big as possible, making the denominator as small as possible. So I'm replacing t with 2 in the numerator and 0 in the denominator, and this simplifies to 80. And this is true over this entire closed infinite vertical strip. Therefore, by the theorem from two pages ago, we can say that f satisfies the Lipschitz, Lipschitz condition on d in the variable y with Lipschitz constant l equals 80. Therefore, the global existence and uniqueness theorem applies over this entire vertical strip. There exists a unique solution of this IVP that doesn't blow up over the entire interval from 0 to 2. And that's real good to know if you want to approximate the solution. Um, Euler's method is probably going to do a decent job, you might think. Now, there is one more kind of warning I need to give near the end here, but you would hope that it would do a decent job. Actually, you don't really need the Euler's method here. This differential equation is easily separable. Divide both sides by y. 
quote unquote multiply both sides by dt. And you've got dy over y equals 5t to the fourth over 1 plus t to the fifth dt. Integrate both sides. You can pretty easily solve for y. And the answer, in fact, for the initial value problem as well is a pretty simple function. It's this function. phi sub 3 of t equals 3 plus 3t to the fifth. Wow. Very simple solution to this differential equation. How do you check it? Plug it into the left-hand side and the right-hand side and simplify. You'll get the same thing when you simplify. Um, and the thing you'll get will be, uh, looks like 15t to the fourth. Give it a try. And when you plug in t equals 0 here, you do get 3. Okay? So keep those kinds of things in mind. Okay? This kind of example illustrates how to apply the theorem, though it is still somewhat limited. We're getting close to the end here. I've just got two more main slides to show you. Um, I do want to show you something in Mathematica, especially for my students, regarding Orther's method, uh, and maybe a little bit more as well. Existence unique, uniqueness consequences. Two pages here. Okay, these are pretty important. These are important applications of existence and uniqueness. First practical consequence of uniqueness. We are mostly focusing on uni uniqueness here, by the way, as far as the applications go. Existence is important because you want to know your solutions exist in the first place if you're going to try to approximate them. I am trying to ultimately bring this ending back to numerical methods at the moment here. In the settings where these theorems can be used, where they apply is another way to say that, so the hypotheses are satisfied, therefore the conclusions are true for examples like this, you can say that distinct solution curves, distinct functions in the graphs, cannot have graphs that touch each other, unlike the case where we had two functions that solved the initial value problems and the graphs did touch each other. They crossed each other, in fact. But when uniqueness applies, graphs of distinct solutions can't touch each other. On the other hand, they are often asymptotic to each other. Uh, they often get arbitrarily close together as t goes to infinity. You get limiting values that are the same. Like, you, For example, we've seen that in the logistic model. You've got equilibrium solution, for example, at y equals 1, and we saw solutions that approached it as t goes to infinity. That often does happen, but the solutions can't touch. They're only asymptotic to each other. And that's what I'm going to mention here again. And yeah, here's one situation we're going to look at Mathematica as well. Let's consider the logistic model with harvesting. So this part is the ordinary logistic model. The minus h here represents harvesting. You know, if this is a fish population, it would represent fishing. Since it's a constant h, it would represent fishing at a constant rate per unit time, like a certain number of thousands of fish per month or per year or something like that. And you assume it's uniform throughout the year. Solving this differential equation, while not impossible, looks very hard. Even if you plug in k equals 0 0.04 and l equals 1, for example, it is possible. And in fact, I already showed you Mathematica can do it, and I'll show you again here. Um, they are difficult to find, though. It would be difficult to do by hand. However, as long as the right-hand side function here, f of y, takes in both positive and negative values, the model will have equilibrium solutions, and in fact, it'll have two that are constant functions. You might take the time to think about why there. <clears throat> Essentially, think about the slope field and seeing that some of the mini tangent lines are going to have positive slopes and some will have negative slopes. When they have zero slopes, that's where you have the equilibrium solutions. Therefore, solutions with initial conditions, here's the, the punchline, between these equilibrium solutions, the y coordinates, y sub zero, are between those two equilibrium solutions, are guaranteed to always be stuck between them for all t. They can't go outside of that horizontal strip. Okay? And in fact, because of that, they will actually end up being defined for all t, though our theorems, our two main theorems here, do not necessarily imply that, including with the global existence one. Let's go to Mathematica and show you that with Mathematica here. So, enter some stuff. Here we use dsolve value to solve this arbitrary initial value problem, and yes, you get a complicated looking thing. It's not something I'd want to find by hand. I'm glad I have Mathematica to do it for me, but once I have this formula, I can copy and paste and plug in, say, k equals 0 0.04 into this expression. 
that is a solution as we saw before. I'm not gonna check it here. Um, and also, if you solve for where the right-hand side function equals zero, you find the y-coordinates of two equilibrium solutions, constant function solutions. So I copied and pasted those formulas down here to get two equilibrium solutions. And what I wanna show you is the graph of solutions in the slope field. You see when h is zero, so there's no harvesting, you see two equilibrium solutions at y equals zero and y equals one. And with your initial condition of 0.1, this blue graph is stuck between them. And we know by the theorems it can't cross those other ones that it has to stay stuck between them for all t. And that will imply it's defined for all t as well. Though again, our theorems can verify that. I could try other initial conditions, including ones above one. If I do try a negative initial condition, we can get, well, essentially a vertical asymptote there. Is it obvious that it's a vertical asymptote? Uh, not necessarily. Um, however, if I increase H, if I allow some harvesting, some fishing, those equilibrium solutions are approaching each other. They're getting closer together. And in fact, once H is high enough, when Y0 is 0 0.236, eventually the prediction is that the fish are going to die off. On the other hand, if Y0 was big enough, they won't die off. But once H is positive, small enough initial conditions will imply the fish will die off. Now, does that really happen in real life? It, real life is more complicated. This oversimplifies things. If H is sufficiently high, those two equilibrium solutions, watch what happens, they merge and go away. They disappeared. Why'd that happen? I'll leave it to you to see if you can figure out why that happened, but do notice if H is large enough, no initial value of Y is going to lead to solutions having a horizontal asymptote. They will, you'll get dying off for all values of Y, though if Y0 is high enough, it could take longer to get down to Y equals zero. Okay, but once again, if we're in the case where the right-hand side function has both positive and negative values. If your initial condition is between these two, the uniqueness guarantees it can't cross. This blue one can't cross the orange one above it, for example. It's going to be stuck between. That is a practical consequence of the theory. All right, just one more slide here and one more look at Mathematica again. Hang on, this is, this is the most important thing for numerical methods right here this last slide. These theorems and examples also have important implications for numerical methods, such as Euler's method, the simplest kind of numerical methods. They help you realize that things can go very wrong. For example, you might be trying to approximate a solution of an IVP that blows up in finite time. It has a vertical asymptote. It will necessarily be a bad approximation if you're using Euler's method in that case, at least if you go out far enough in time. Other examples of things that can occur are informed by the uniqueness theorem. Sometimes numerical methods can produce wild results, wild kind of behavior, unexpected. Knowing the theory, the uniqueness properties as in particular, can help you realize that such results might be fictitious, and I'm about to show you an example. Consider this initial value problem right here. dy dt equals f of t comma y equals e to the t sine of y. y of zero equals five. Think about this for a moment. This differential equation actually has infinitely many equilibrium solutions infinitely many horizontal lines that solve it. In fact, they are at y equals n times pi, where n can be any integer, 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, etc. because those are where sine of y equals 0. And at that lowest values of y, the lines in your slope field are going to be horizontal. The right-hand side function is going to equal 0. Even though e to the t itself could be very large when t is large, the fact that sine of these things is 0 when y equals n pi, where n is an integer, means the right-hand side will equal zero along those horizontal lines, and you will get equilibrium solutions there. 
However, if you apply Euler's method, which we talked about in lecture 25, with h, or if you prefer delta t equal to 0 0.05, and say n equal to 120 over the interval from 0 to 6, you get the following graph, which cannot be accurate because of the theory, because distinct solution curves can't cross, and because we've got equilibrium solutions here at y equals n pi. Here's the graph. Notice it is wild behavior. All the, you know, it's behaving quite fine for a while, then all of a sudden, wild behavior. Is that really what's going on? Why did this happen? It's not really what's going on. And it, it, you can say it, it can't be what's going on because you're crossing equilibrium solutions, for example, at y equals pi and y equals zero. They're, they're both going to be equilibrium solutions. And in fact, it looks like the solution is initially approaching y equals pi. But then this seems to indicate that it crosses it. But it can't. This is happening because e to the t grows so fast as t increases. You know, you're not exactly on y equals pi here. You're just really close to it. And once t gets to about 5.2 or so, all of a sudden, e to the t is large enough that you get wild output from Euler's method. By the way, I took this example from Blanchard, Devaney, and Hall, and so that is a kudos to them. They thought of this, of this example. Okay, let's look at Mathematica now and just remind you, remind my students in particular of the Mathematica code that will generate this. I actually modified it compared to lecture 25 and made it a bit easier. Um, essentially, you want to use nestList to iterate a function to implement Euler's method. This part here is a bit more complicated. It's a function of both t and w where you add h to the t, that's the delta t, each time, and you do w plus h times f of t w to the second coordinate. That is the essence of Euler's method. Again, we talked about that in lecture 25. This will generate data for the initial value problem when h is 0 0.05, w0, which is the same as y, 0 is 5, and I do 120 steps. I get these data. And notice I do seem to be approaching pi here in the second coordinate, but all of a sudden it goes wild. If I plot these data, I get this wild-looking graph. Okay. Final comment, very final comment to make, is that this is not the end of the story in terms of thinking about these things. If you want to be good at numerical analysis, there's also one more important issue for my students in section 5.1 to consider. I'm not going to consider it. Is the initial value problem that you're considering what's called a well-posed? My students here in spring 2020, this is the very last lecture and it was a doozy. Uh, future students, if I'm using these lectures, there are going to be more to come. As far as other people watching these, it's currently May 6th today, 2020. I'm not sure how soon I'm going to be able to post more of these uh, because we're wrapping up the semester and final exams are coming and you know we're dealing with the coronavirus going around. Um, I do want to continue this lecture series at some point. Maybe I can do one or two videos in the coming weeks, but I'm not sure. It depends on how my grading goes. But thanks for watching, and I hope it was really informative.